Today's subject is extinction. Extinction is where animals and plants are gone completely, that there's none left. And there's two kinds of extinctions. There is one called a gradual extinction. The word gradual basically means slow. And then there's one called an immediate extinction. That's where something really big happens and wipes out entire species of animals. So we're going to start with gradual extinctions because that is actually the most common extinction. We're seeing them today, right? What usually causes extinction, there's two factors. It's three factors. It's usually weather related. All things are connected. The plants rely on the weather. The plant eaters rely on the plants. The meat eaters rely on the plant eaters. And so is the circle of life. Circle of life. So is the circle of life. So if it's a desert and cactus live there, if the weather began to change and it started raining a lot, well, cactus don't like a lot of rain and they would die. But what would take their place would be new kinds of plants. Well, if you're an animal that has to live on cactus and your cactus is gone, you're going to die, right? Well, see, when there's a big change, all plants and animals have one of three options. You can move to a place you like better, you can adapt to your new environment, or you die. Move, adapt, or die. Those are your options. So throughout history, weather has changed, environments have changed, and that causes animals to either move to adapt to that change or they go extinct. Well, what are some of the things that can cause these changes? Well, one of the things that can cause a change is volcanic activity. When a volcano erupts, it's not just dangerous for everything in the immediate area. The ash and dirt that goes up into the atmosphere, that can change the weather and it can cause an extinction way far away. Let me give you an example. A volcano erupted in Wyoming, and the ash that went up into the air traveled across the United States, and when it finally came down, it was in Nebraska, and it killed everything that was there. That's an example of how a nasty-looking volcano can cause such a horrible event way far away. So that's an example of how volcanoes can cause extinctions. Now, next are things like hurricanes. Hurricanes certainly can affect all life that they are near, right? Like, let's say, for instance, animals that live along the coast and a big hurricane hits. Well, you know, it could kill all of those animals living there. But when hurricanes cause a problem is when they start happening more often or they start happening at different times. Animals, uh, animals will... Um, lay their eggs at a certain time of the year. Well, let's say that there's a group of dinosaurs who go to the coast every March to lay their eggs. Let's say that's their nesting season. Well, hurricanes never happened until June or July. But what if there was a change and a hurricane came in while those animals had laid their eggs? What do you think is going to happen to all of the eggs and therefore all of the babies? Well, that's how something like a hurricane can cause an extinction event. Something else that can cause animals to become extinct are floods. Now, not only because the water will drown them, but there's another reason. Here's an image of a bunch of wildebeest from uh, Africa that are crossing a river, and you see there are thousands of them. Well, dinosaurs did this exact same thing. Here's the problem. If you have an entire species of dinosaur, and they're crossing a flooding river and panic strikes and they all drown, that could actually cause an extinction. And even if it doesn't kill every single one, think about the impact that has on the meat eaters who use those animals for a food source. So see, that can cause an extinction. Here's an example of a glacier. Now, this is something that happens when the earth begins to cool, and that's happened a number of times in our environment. The Earth's environment has changed over and over and over again. Do you know at one time, New York, the state of New York, where my friend Eric Matthews lives, the state of New York was buried under one mile of ice. One mile of ice used to bury it. Well, think about how different the environment was then. 
think about how cold it was. Now, that means that the plants and animals that lived there were used to that. But what happened if the earth began to warm up and that giant sheet of ice began to thaw out? Think about how that can cause an extinction. But the other thing, it's not just weather related, and we're feeling the effects of it today, and that is migration and people or animals moving from place to place. A couple of things happen when new animals move into a place that they've never been before. One, the possibility of spreading germs, diseases, right? That's a possibility. Two, it's that now there's new predators that I've never seen before and I don't know how to defend myself. Or if I'm a predator, now I see an animal I've never seen and I run up to eat it and I find out, wait a minute, you mean think that thing has a spike on its tail and it stabbed my friend Joe? Joe got stabbed by that thing? So you see, when you mix animals together, there can be a lot of problems. And there's a number of ways that happens. Now here's an image of how humans, early humans, migrated all over the world. See, there was a time where you could walk from Africa to Asia and from Asia to North America and from North America to South America. At one time, animals could even cross into uh, Antarctica because all of the continents were connected in one big landmass called Pangaea. Well, animals were able to move back and forth between those, and that meant they ran into each other. And that meant that they were in a lot of trouble because you mix animals that have never seen each other and you deal with, um, uh, you, ta uh, you deal with um, uh, diseases, but predation. Well, look, here is an example of some animals that migrated from North America down to South America and South America up to North America. A long time ago, the giant ground sloths only lived in South America. But they were able to migrate when a land bridge formed. They were able to migrate up into North America. So were the killer birds. And so were the giant armadillos. Well, in South America, our North American animals moved to South America. Things like llamas, tapirs, saber-toothed cats, giant elephants, uh, foxes, horses, all those animals mixed together and moved into new areas. And by doing that, they were able to spread diseases and they were able to introduce new animals that weren't used to each other. So little by little, those things started slowly killing out certain species. Now, remember I said you have three options, move, adapt, or die. Adaptation is what most animals are able to do. We are an example of that. Throughout our history, we've dealt with predators, we've dealt with viruses, and we adapted and were able to overcome those. That's why we're not extinct, and that's why we won't go extinct anytime soon, because we have the ability to adapt. Now, we also have the ability to do things other animals can't do. But um, uh, when those animals come together, those are those three choices, move, adapt, or die. And in most cases, animals are okay. But other animals like the saber-toothed cat, how come it's not here? It couldn't adapt to a changing environment. Woolly mammoths, how come they're not here? Couldn't adapt to a changing environment. Now, sometimes the environment changes so fast that nothing has time to adapt. And that is called an immediate extinction. And that is what we're going to focus on because that's the thing that caused the biggest problem. Immediate extinctions mean they happen so quickly, no animal has the opportunity to move and no animal has or plant has the opportunity to adapt. It doesn't happen too much stuff. Uh, it just wipes them out. One of the examples would be if you are living on the volcano when it erupts, you get an immediate extinction because there's no opportunity for you to run away. You're not going to outrun that. So what was it that caused the immediate extinction to happen to the dinosaurs? Ah, the most recent science and the most accurate science says it was an impact of an asteroid. Now, asteroids are giant rocks that enter our Earth's atmosphere. Most of the time, those asteroids burn up. They never even reach the Earth. That's why if you ever see a shooting star, that's an asteroid that's burning up before it even reaches the ground. But some are so large that they don't burn up. And that's what happened uh, at the end of the Cretaceous period, at the end of the Cretaceous period. And by the way, for everybody out there, um, 
in the educator's guide, there is a picture. You have your, your uh, timeline of all the things in earth history, all the timelines. You can see when things, what timelines there were. So it's at the end of the Cretaceous, and that was the end of the Mesozoic era. So the end of the Mesozoic era, the one listed in bright green, and the blue above it is the Cenozoic era. What separates the blue from the, uh, the green is this asteroid which struck the Earth and caused the problem. Where it hit is it hit in a place called the Yucatan Peninsula. Look on the map. You see it. It was in Mexico. Look over to the right of Mexico in that light area near the Gulf of Mexico, and that is the Yucatan Peninsula. Here is the spot where it hit. It didn't hit on land. It actually hit in the water. So the Yucatan Peninsula is where this asteroid struck. Now, here's what happened. That asteroid was the size of Mount Everest. It was 30,000 feet high. When you go outside and when the jets start flying again and the planes start taking off again and you look up in the sky and you see that little trail of looks like smoke coming off of a plane, that plane is between 10 and 30,000 feet. I want you to think about a rock that was as tall as that because that's how big the rock was that struck. It hit in the Yucatan. Here's the problem with when it struck down there. When it hit, it struck with so much force that it actually caused the earth to shake. You might have heard that impact circle the earth, no matter where you were on planet earth, that rock was so big that you would have seen it and you would have felt it. And it hit with more force than all the bombs in the world combined. It threw dirt and dust up in the air. But here's the big problem is, remember I said it hit in the water? Remember I showed you? Let me find that slide again. Remember I showed you that it hit in the water? Okay, here's what happened. When it hit, it sent tsunamis. It sent tsunamis that were three miles high out in every direction. Walls of water moved in every direction. Any small island, most of the inlands in Mexico and in North America and down to South America were covered. And remember when I was talking in the erosion class, when I mentioned to you guys about how a tsunami can move boulders, this is what I was referencing. This hit with so much force that it moved boulders the size of cars Hundreds of miles inland, hundreds of miles inland. So that was the first thing that happened is the first thing that happened is we had gigantic tsunamis following the tsunamis. So much dirt and dust went up into the atmosphere that it actually covered the entire planet in a layer of darkness. The whole planet, we believe, became dark because the dirt and ash prevented the sunlight. It Daytime became nighttime all over the world. Now you have dinosaurs that are standing there, and you have uh, pterosaurs, and you have the swimming reptiles. And they hear this giant explosion. They, see, they saw the giant fireball, probably didn't know what it was. They saw the giant fireball come down. They hear the explosion. They feel the earth shake under their feet. Everything on earth felt it. Then a wall of water came rushing away from the area. So if you were along the coastal areas, you saw a wall of water that was three miles high coming at you faster than you can escape. And then the earth becomes very dark because there's so much dirt and ash and dust in the air. But not only did that happen, but when the asteroid hit... It turned the rock into molten lava. Thousands of pieces of molten rock were thrown back up into the atmosphere like a gun fired, a cannon shot them into the air. And they suddenly started raining down all over the planet. And that meant that the forest on Earth had caught fire. 
You have forests on fire. You have darkness from the ash. You have tsunamis. These things instantaneously change the entire environment on planet Earth. It changed everything. And here's the last bit of bad news. There were two certain kind of rocks that are found in um, the Yucatan Peninsula. One of them is called anhydrite, and the other is limestone. Now, those two rocks don't cause any problems whatsoever unless you mix heat, pressure, and water together with those two rocks. When you do, you get sulfuric acid. Hydro, I mean, uh, yeah, sulfuric, sulfuric acid. So remember I said that all that dust and stuff went up into the air? So you have flaming, melted pieces of rock. Now you also have a deadly gas, sulfuric gas, that will kill anything that breathes it in. There was a person, a paleontologist, that gave the best example of what life was like. He said, if you turn the broiler on in your oven and you move everybody into it, that's what it would have been like for a moment. Because for a moment in time, you had the giant tsunamis. You had dust and ash covering the entire earth. And you had forest fires burning all over the planet. One paleontologist suggested that 98% of everything on earth was on fire at one time. Now, we can't prove any of these things. I don't want you guys to think that this is something we know absolutely happened. because. But there is a lot of science to help us figure it out. So... All the dinosaurs get wiped out. The sea creatures get wiped out. The uh, flying pterosaurs get wiped out. But not everything died. Some animals figured out a way to escape it. Most of them were little. They either went underground, which is probably where they went, because all these terrible things I talked about, that didn't last forever. The dust in the atmosphere, that dust slowly sank back down to the earth. The forest fires burned themselves out. And just like forest fires today, the pine cones and the seeds survived. They were ready to start sprouting again. Once the weather started getting normal, life came back to Earth. Everything was okay. But not for the dinosaurs. Well, how do I know then that all of these things occurred? It's because of something we call the KT boundary. Across the Earth, there is a very thin line of a chemical or of a mineral called iridium. Iridium is very rare, but it's found on asteroids. So, a geologist and his son were finding this layer everywhere, and they looked at that layer under magnification, and what they found was there was tiny little pieces of molten glass, which was rock and sand that had been turned to, to uh, liquid, and they found ash, and they found iridium. And that, sci or that geologist said something big happened because this line means the entire earth was covered. And he finds that line everywhere. That line is very, very thin. It's a very, very thin line. Um, you can see where that finger is pointing at the iridium line. It's very thin. But that is the line that is blanketed the earth. So that's how they knew the ash went up into the air. That's how they knew there was molten rock because they find evidence in it. And the closer to the Yucatan Peninsula, the thicker that line becomes because that's where most of it fell down. No dinosaur bone has ever been found above that line. Millions of dinosaur bones have been found below that line. We find, remember in our first class when I showed you the layers of earth, well, you have dinosaur bone, dinosaur bone, dinosaur bone, nothing. We have the KT line, the iridium line. Above it, mammal, mammal, mammals, mammals, mammals. That line is the line of demarcation. And why is it called the KT boundary? Here's why. Remember, we have our time periods. We have Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Remember that? Cretaceous starts with a C. Well, the Cretaceous was the end, and the new time we call the tertiary, starts with a T. Well, there's another time period called the Cambrian, starts with a C. So instead of calling it the CT boundary between Cretaceous and tertiary, they changed the C to a K. So 
That's why it's KT boundary. K represents the Cretaceous, just with a different letter, okay? I hope that makes sense to you guys. So the KT boundary is where life for the dinosaurs ended. And so this uh, geologist proposed this. And everybody said, the skeptics, and by the way, I want to say this right here now to all of you. Being skeptical of a scientific hypothesis is the right thing to do. Don't ever assume that because a scientist says it, that's the only answer. New evidence can change that. So when you question the, the result of a scientific experiment, that is what you are supposed to do. Don't question math. Math is definitive. Two plus two always equals four, no matter how you feel about it. But science is different. Because different measurements can change. Different ev evidence can change. So this geologist said a giant asteroid must have struck this earth and caused this layer. And all of his skeptics, who were correct, said, well, if that happened, then where is, shouldn't we see a giant hole in the ground? And nobody could figure out where it happened. But then, NASA spent, sent a, a aircraft, a, a spaceship up to, uh, up to take pictures. And they were using a special kind of film that could pick up weird things in the ground. We call them anomalies. And what they found off of the Yucatan Peninsula was a 180 mile wide hole. But you couldn't see it because most of it was under the ocean. And because it was so gigantic if you were standing on it, you had no idea that you were standing on the edge of an impact crater. To give you an idea of size, if you here's an experiment for you. 180 miles. Find out where you live and find out what is 180 miles away. Like, for instance, if you live in San Antonio, you might choose Houston. That is how big the hole in the ground was. Remember, I said that asteroid was 30,000 feet tall. And when it hit, it absolutely wiped out the dinosaurs. But birds survived. A lizard survived. Crocodiles, fish, birds, sharks, mosquitoes, cockroaches. You can't get rid of cockroaches no matter what you do. All of those animals survived. So even though it was a terrifying moment, some animals were able to adapt or at least hide. So those are the two kinds of extinctions, gradual and um, uh, immediate. Dinosaurs suffered an immediate extinction. Now, dinosaurs had been adapting all along from the, the Triassic when they first appeared all the way to the end of the Cretaceous. They were adapting all that time. That's why there was different dinosaurs. The tallest trees occurred in the Jurassic. The tallest dinosaurs occurred in the Jurassic to take advantage. Trees got shorter, dinosaurs got shorter. Dinosaurs developed horns for defense. Tyrannosaurus rexes got bigger to overcome that defense. Raptors show up. Dinosaurs develop armor to defend themselves against raptors. Those are examples of adaptations. And dinosaurs were adapting the whole time. But the impact of that asteroid was so great, they could not adapt quickly enough, and that is why they went extinct. I cannot tell you, why the animals that lived, lived. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe one day you will. Here's your project for today, everybody. This is what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you so that you have a better understanding of a gradual extinction. I want you to choose a plant, any plant. Doesn't matter which plant it is. And then I want, so it can be a rose if you want to use a flower. It can be broccoli. Ooh, broccoli, I love broccoli. It can be a plant that we eat. It can be cactus. It can be anything. I want you to just pick one. And then I want you to research what kind of plant and um, what kind of animals either use that for a food source or they help it. So, for instance, let's say you pick a rose, okay? Well, we can pick a hummingbird because hummingbirds rely on the rose for nectar. Um, uh, maybe a rose wasn't the right choice for that. Maybe a honeysuckle. We'll pick honeysuckle. So, hummingbirds rely on it, right? So do some insects. So, I want you to pick a plant. And then start finding a list of animals that are connected to that plant. So let's pick uh, bees, okay? I pick honeysuckle. Next to that, I'm going to write the word bees because bees rely on honeysuckles. Honeysuckles rely on bees. Now, what kind of animals eat bees? 
Well, there are animals that eat bees. Lizards. So I'm going to write lizard next to the word bee because lizards eat bees. What kind of animals eat lizards? I'm going to write snake. Snake I'm going to put in line next. So I have honeysuckle, bee, lizard, snake. What kind of animals eat snakes? I'm going to write badger. Badger will eat a snake. So I'm going to write badger next to that. What kind of animals eat badgers? I'm going to write coyote next. What kind of animal eats coyotes? I'm going to write mountain lion. So after you make a list of all of the animals you can think of, I want you to think of those animals as dominoes. And imagine each one is standing side by side. You have honeysuckle, bee, lizard, snake, badger, coyote. You have all those. And all of those are living together happily. But the one thing that you didn't write down was weather. You are the weather. If you come in and you change and you hit your honeysuckle domino, what's it going to do? It's going to fall over. And that's going to knock down the bee domino. And the bee domino is going to knock down the lizard domino and over and over. And that is an example of a gradual extinction. So find yourself a plant. Um, uh, find out which animals are associated with it. Do some research and make yourself a list. And if you would like, post your results on the, ask, uh, on the Dinosaur George Jr. page. I would love to see them. Also, at the beginning of this class, I mentioned uh, using those uh, prefixes and suffixes that you would find in the Educator's Guide. If you create your own dinosaur, please post a, your, the name of it and give us the information. I love seeing that. And with that, it's our 30 minutes up. Class is dismissed. On Monday, I will send out a message of which topic is going to happen on Tuesday and which one's going to be Friday. Take care of yourselves. Take care of the people around you. And now I will hang on and I will start taking your questions. And by the way, for those of you who were being responded to, Michelle, um, our events director, was nice enough to be responding to your questions. So if you wondered how I was answering your questions, Michelle was nice enough to do that. So with that, thank you, Michelle, for, for all of your time again. Thank you all for joining us. I will see you all on uh, Tuesday. And um, now I will start looking at your questions, and I'll start answering them, and I'll hang around for 10, 15 minutes and answer whatever questions I can, okay? Thank you, guys. Have a good weekend. Take care of yourselves. All right, let's go with questions. Um, like a food chain. Yes, absolutely, Alex. Yes, Create a food chain using animals. I'm glad you said that. That's very, very good. You can create a food chain and then see how all of those animals are interconnected and then how, if something interfered with the food chain, how that would go down the line and cause an extinction. Alex, good point. Glad you're doing that. Alex, I wish you were here. One of the things I was going to tell you, Alex, is as soon as flights are able and everybody's able to get back on their feet, I'm going to come back out there again and spend a couple of days with you and your family uh, just just to see you guys. Absolutely love it. And oh, by the way, uh, ooh, Emma, good point about your bees. Very good point about your bees. When you knock down the bee out of your list, you can also start knocking down humans to your, excuse me, you can add humans to your list because um, you're absolutely right. That would, um, uh, that really, um, that really is going to, uh, that's going to cause a big problem. Do you think any humans would have survived the same asteroid strike today? Brilliant question coming from Anthony. Um, you know, if we were far enough away and we were already living in some sort of protective shelter, like a cave, for instance, I think people that had access to caves might have been able to eke it out, probably would have. Um, I, I, I think so. Did people exist before the asteroid hit? No, Sheree, they come after. And that's kind of what opens the door for mammals to, to take place. Uh, so there was acid rain. A Amy, yes, there was acid rain that rained down on top of everything else. How long were dinosaurs alive? Brooke, do you mean how, long, how old did they become? Some lived to be maybe 100 years old like the long necks. But dinosaurs were around for about 250 million years before all of that happened. Are mammoths elephants? Amanda, yes, mammoths are related to elephants. But they're more closely related to Asian elephants than African elephants. Did some dinosaurs live in the water? Russell, no, but it looks like some were fish eaters, pescivores. And so they probably spent a lot of time in the water, but they are made to be on land. One would be Spinosaurus, uh, Suchomimus, 
baryonyx. Those animals seem to hunt in the water, but they're not really made for living in the water. Uh, were affected by lo- uh, were the dinosaurs with armor. Uh, Amaya wants to know if dinosaurs with armor were affected by lava or falling rocks. They were affect- They were protected a little bit by rocks, but not by lava because it would have burned through. They couldn't have done anything. Amanda Wade or an energy pyramid is another brilliant description of that. Uh, did and Emilio wants to know if any dinosaurs hunted the T Rex? Yes, Emilio. I think other meat eaters hunted baby T Rexes. Maybe not only to eat them, but to get rid of them. Because once you were an adult T-Rex, the only thing an adult T-Rex feared was a bigger T-Rex. So yes, I believe any carnivore would have tried to kill a baby. Any plant eater would have killed a baby, not to eat it, but to get rid of it. Um, what was the very first dinosaur on the planet? Uh, Kaylin wants to uh, wants to know. Uh, it was probably uh, Eoraptor or, um, uh, gosh, my mind goes blank of who the other one. Who was the first person to discover dinosaurs? It was actually a woman. George, if I wanted to learn more about paleontology, should I study my other prehistoric animals such as saber-toothed cats and mammoths? Yes, um, Alex, if you want to know more about paleontology, yes, any prehistoric animal you should study. Any prehistoric animal you should study. Um, um, I, I, anything to do with prehistory is going to help you with your studies on paleontology. Uh, what was the largest extinction? You know what? I did not have time to go through the mass extinctions. I am so sorry about that. But you will find that information. What was the largest extinction is what they wanted to know. Um, in the uh, guide, let me go over them. Uh, the biggest was the one that occurred at the end of the Permian era. That is where, and let me bring up my uh, timeline. The Permian era, that's the one that separates the light green from the bright green or the dark green from the bright green. That's the Permian extinction. That was the biggest one that occurred. It is suspected that 98% of every living animal on earth was wiped out. What caused that one? We don't know. It may have been incredible amounts of volcanic activity. We we just don't know. Uh, Kim, what was my, well, Curtis, what's my favorite marine reptile? Tylosaurus. I love Tylosaurus. Are cave people real, uh, Jolene wants to know. Well, there were early humans who lived in caves, but they only call them cave people. But really, most of them were, were wanderers and gatherers. They, they traveled nonstop. Most of them didn't build houses. Most of them traveled, and that's why they spread all over the earth. Uh, Cecilia wants to know if I like Pachycephalosaurus. I love it. And Cecilia, the fact that you can pronounce it is very impressive. I'm very proud of you, honey. Uh, I love Pachycephalosaurus. I think they're fantastic. What mammals lived at the same time as dinosaurs? Most, uh, Ryan, most of the mammals that lived with dinosaurs were little tiny guys, and they were probably nocturnal. They only came out at night. That was their adaptation to survive with these, with these big animals. The dinosaurs were, had too much control over the planet. Mammals didn't have much of an opportunity. But when the smoke cleared and the dust settled after the extinction, mammals came out of their burrows and looked around and went, oh, yeah, baby. The earth is ours. And then that's when mammals took over. Um, let's see. Did the bowhead whale live at that time? I don't know, uh, honey. I don't know if the bowhead whale lived. I know there was early whales. There was a bunch. There was Pachycetus and Ambulocetus. And, and there was um, uh, Leviathan was an early one. Uh, there was Brigma Fisetter. He's another early whale. There was a bunch of early whales. Uh, let's see. Was there acid rain? Marge, yes, there was acid rain during that time, and that was because of the mixing of those two rocks that I talked about. So our project is supposed to be a food chain. Yes, uh, yes, a food chain is the better way to put it than what I did. Uh, let's see. What was the first dinosaur on Earth? Uh, Kalen? I think, I think Lagasuchus, I think, is the very first dinosaur that we know of. I think. There may have been something else. But that's my guess of who was the earliest dinosaur. Uh, And yeah, um, this time, (laughs) this time, Alex, when I come, it won't be a surprise. So you have time to prepare so that uh, we can figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to hang out and that kind of stuff. What survived? Dennis wants to know, or Denise wants to know, what survived? Birds, bats, mosquitoes, cockroaches, fish, lizards, sharks, insects, a lot of stuff survived. Uh, let's see, are asteroids real? Yes, they are. But let me tell you about asteroids. And I forgot to add this to it, and I wish I would have, because that was kind of a scary scenario, right? That's scary to think that an asteroid can do that. 
NASA actually works to chart as many asteroids as they can so that we know in advance when a big one is going to come and hit the Earth. And if it is, there are things in place to deal with it. I was able to spend time with two NASA scientists once who we talked about this, and they told me that there's a couple of ways that they can fix it. One way would be to shoot a rocket into space to land on the asteroid, and then they would kick in the big rocket engines and push the asteroid out of the way of the Earth. That's one way. Another way is blow it up. Fire a nuclear weapon into space and blow it up. So there's a couple of ways they can actually deal with that. So I don't think that's ever going to be an issue with us. Uh, and you're seven. Emilio, I can't believe you're seven years old. Man, that's crazy. You know, first time I met you, Emilio, was years ago when we did that program where your mom was nice enough to come in and volunteer. And that's when I first met you. And you're getting so big now. Was a snake considered a dinosaur? No, Darcy, a snake is not considered a dinosaur because it doesn't have the right kind of skeletal structure. It is a cousin because it's a reptile, but it's not a true dinosaur. Um, when a dinosaur dies, what happens to its heart? Uh, Culverton, the heart usually decomposes. It rots, it disappears. The heart is like everything else on the dinosaur. It's made of soft tissue, and it usually decomposes. Uh so our project is supposed to be a food chain and the consequences of interference. Thank you, Giselle. What a beautiful way to put it. I wish I had, I wish I had that. I wish I would have thought of that as the way to describe it because that is a perfect description of it. Uh, Jackson wants to know if you found a Moses or a fossil. Do you like them? Yes, Jackson, I have found pieces of Tylosaurus. I found them in the North Sulphur River near Dallas. And yes, I like them very much. I found teeth. I found vertebrae. I found the rostrum, which is the end of the nose. I found a part of the arm bone. I found some tail vertebra. Never found a whole one, but I did. And I love them very much. I like them very, very much. Um, how long did raptors live? Margie, raptors didn't live very long. My guess is probably like, like the age of dogs. Like they maybe lived to be 12 or 13 years old. I think they went through their, uh, I think they went through their life very, very quickly. That's what I think. Uh, which was the dominant predator of Africa, Carcharodontosaurus or Spinosaurus? I believe Carcharodontosaurus would have been more of a threat than Spinosaurus as the top predator. Spinosaurus is a pretty bad dude, but that elongated snout is not really as well designed for combat with big things. If you have a long skinny nose, it's not as powerful because your muscles, think of this as the long skinny nose and your muscles are back here in the back. Your muscles are less likely to be effective way up here in the front. Now, you do have other muscles in the middle, but if your nose is short, like if your mouth is short and your muscles are right there, then you've got an incredible bite force. So I think Carcharodontosaurus would have been bigger. Yes, Spinosaurus would have been at the top of the food chain, but he would have shared it with a dinosaur called Carcharodontosaurus. Um, let's see. Uh, are Gigantoraptors... Uh, are they plant eaters? I believe Gigantoraptor, I believe it is an omnivore. I'm almost sure it's an omnivore. Uh, do I like Ornithomimus? Very, very much, Curtis. I love Ornithomimus. Love those dinosaurs. I love all of them. Um, let's see. What was the last living dinosaur? Danny? Well, there was all those that were there. So that would have been T-Rex and Kylosaurus. A lot of raptors, a lot of duckbills, a lot of horned dinosaurs. Those would have all been the ones that saw the day, the last days of the dinosaurs. Because there wasn't just a few of them left. There was a lot of dinosaurs when that asteroid hits. Ashley, you're very welcome, and I hope you enjoyed this new format. I hope you guys all enjoyed this new format. If you did like it, please comment and let us know if you like this better. It's certainly more reliable than being outside. Uh, let's see. Uh, are birds reptiles? Uh, birds are related to reptiles on the family tree, but they're not classified. They're their own classification. If an animal survived the extinction in order to adapt, could they have gone from herbivore to carnivore or vice versa? Brilliant. Emma, brilliant. That is a brilliant explanation for how an animal like, um, uh, Dinochirus, uh, or, or let's do Therizinosaurus. Let's do Therizinosaurus. Therizinosaurus appeared to be an herbivore. Some people think it was an omnivore. Its earlier ancestor was a carnivore. So clearly, it evolved to adapt, and it decided that eating a mix of diet was the right thing to do, 
and maybe Therizinosaurus, by the time Therizinosaurus comes along, it says, I've adapted only for plant eating. So yes, I believe that those animals use in food intake just as easily as an adapt, ad, adaptive tool as let's say, for instance, um, let's see, uh, I can hear you lost all sound. Oh, did it break away? So I'm back again. Okay, good, Alex, I'm back. Um, so let's take an elephant, for instance. Elephants began to grow thick hair during the ice age when the earth experienced global climate change and the earth got colder. They adapted by growing hair. So some animals can adapt by doing that, and others can adapt by changing their food source. That's brilliant. Oh, uh, uh, let's see. Amy wants to know why was Spinosaurus at the top of the food chain? Because no other predator hunted it, and it was a carnivore that hunted other animals, and that's what puts it at the top of the food chain. It was the biggest, most effective hunter. Uh, have you heard of the meteor coming in April? Summer wants to know. Yes, Summer, I have. And that's not, it's not one that's going to cause the problem. It's not going to, it's not going to cause any of us. I think, I actually think it's going to miss the earth completely, but I think we're going to be able to see it, which I think is going to be cool. Uh, where is Allosaurus? You mean the toy that I had, the one that I had yesterday, or where is Allosaurus in the history of life? Allosaurus lived in the Jurassic period. Allosauruses were all extinct before the asteroid, so my beautiful Allosaurus was gone away. Uh, what was the smallest dinosaur? There's a bunch of little ones. I know Micropachycephalosaurus is tiny. Uh, Musaurus is a tiny, but I think Musaurus was just a baby, I believe. But I don't know who the smallest is anymore. They're finding so many. I can't. I, I can't. Um, I can't figure out who's the smallest anymore. Uh, let's see. Are birds really dinosaurs? Uh, Abigail wants to know. Yes, Abby. Do you mind if I call you Abby? Some people like the name Abigail. I love Abigail. I think it's a beautiful name. But I'm going to call you Abigail because that's what you wrote. Yes, Abigail, birds are classified as dinosaurs. When we look at their skeleton, they are almost the exact same as meat-eating dinosaurs. So, yes, honey, they are dinosaurs. Uh, thank you, Russell. I appreciate very much that you enjoyed this. Uh, let's see. Is the Jurassic crocodile a dinosaur? Uh, Yaniv, that's a good question. They're not dinosaurs no matter when they live because their legs are different. They were living with the dinosaurs, but they're not the same. They are related. Crocodiles are reptiles, and dinosaurs fit into their own little family group. That's very good. What is the biggest dinosaur from Maya? Uh, wow. It's probably Argentinosaurus or Sauroposeidon. It's probably one of those big ones. That's one of the big long necks, and they were gigantic. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you, Michelle, for all of your hard work. And thank all of you very much for your questions, but I have got to go. I hope you liked uh, this new format because this is the way I plan to do the remainder of the courses. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a great weekend, everybody. Stay safe, and I will talk to you all soon. Bye-bye, everybody.